Hey, Eric. Hey, Chris. You want to do another one of those seasons? <laughs> yeah. Another season of Retrograde Amnesia? The hit podcast. It's like a book club for RPGs, video games. Sort of. Yeah. Okay. Let's first play some hot sounds. Retrograde Amnesia, a comprehensive podcast where we discuss classic and Japanese role-playing games, chapter by chapter, beat by beat. Welcome to season five of this podcast. My name is Chris. I am joined today, as always, by Eric. Hello, Eric. Hey, man. Welcome to season five, our fifth season. Wow. This is episode 205 of Retrograde Amnesia. It's 205 episodes in four years. So Not counting all the bonus episodes available at patreon.com slash retro AM. Don't start hawking the wares yet, Eric. <laughs> we just got here. For new listeners for Zeno Saga, what is this podcast? I guess you could call it a linear audio analysis of a video game. That's great. Sort of like a book club, Bravo. but a little bit more than that. Almost four years and we've nailed the definition. Finally, I finally got it down. I wrote it down right here. We explore, I think, each and every moment of the video game in an in-depth manner while trying to avoid spoilers. Although I think we sometimes pick at the bits of foreshadowing here and there, but we do try to avoid spoilers as we go so people can play along with us if you've never played the game before. We also try to figure out why and how each moment succeeds or fails as part of the larger experience of the video game. And I think we'll also try to articulate how the game was impactful at the time it was released and maybe how it impacts us today and how it holds up. Child brains versus adult brains. And in this case of Xenosaga, both of us played this game when it was released and then again now. I like the idea of moments as building blocks. And as we slowly build the video game with those blocks, discovering how the game continues to work or not work as a narrative and a gameplay experience as we go along. I like thinking about that kind of as we analyze the game. And those blocks build the podcast. Yes, yes. And we, speaking of building the podcast, this podcast was built originally around the concept of doing this kind of analysis to the video game Xenogears. And we thought after we finished Xenogears that our patrons at patreon.com slash retro AM would vote for us to cover Xenosaga for our second season. But Chrono Cross came through with a last minute upset. Finally, things have come full circle, and we are back here to cover Xenosaga Episode 1. Almost four years after we started covering Xenogears. Yes. As always, we are joined by The RealNet, a collective of patrons who are listening to us record live. Hello, RealNet. Thank you once again for your support, and thank you for helping us build this show. We're also joined by the fake net, our post-production AI companion, a voice from either heaven or hell who occasionally drops in with information we can't remember and or forgot to look up at the time we composed our notes. Initializing fake net. I have been exposed to 5,000 hours of mandatory humanity acknowledgement training videos for a kinder, gentler me. Hello, fake net. Oh, fuck off, crisp, you n- <laughs> Sorry. Hello, crisp. It's good to be here with you both. I just can't wait to fill in the gaps in your research. Thank you, Eric. I love always introducing the fake net on the first episode of a season because you give a very articulate, well-delivered, literal definition of what the fake net yeah, is. Yeah, I mean, people hear a soundbite from Xenogears that is maybe a half second long where someone says five words in a row, and it sounds like nothing, but it is initializing the fake net. Yes, indeed. So the normal part of our podcast where we go through it chapter by chapter, beat by beat, if you want to just get to that before getting all of the development information, please skip to timestamp. 44 minutes, 17 seconds. But until then, we're going to talk about some brief development history because I like facts. I love facts. Chris, let's talk about release history first. Mm -hmm. Xenosaga, episode one, Der Wills are mocked. Did you say that? I think so. German fake net, can you help us out? Fake nets initialisieren. Yes. It is pronounced der Wille zur Macht. Well, anyway, this game was developed by a newly formed Yokohama studio, Monolith Soft. Yes. And published by Namco for the Sony PlayStation 2. Of course, Bandai bought Namco in 2003, Monolith Soft was bought by Nintendo in 2007, and Xenosaga has been unceremoniously mothballed since 2006. But that's all in the future, Chris, and right now we're still in the past of the early aughts. Yes. In that past, the first episode of Xenosaga was released in Japan on February 28, 2002. Cool. Do you recall how many days it took to get here? Yes. 
Somewhere in the vicinity of, uh, 361. 362 days. You fucked Damn. that up. Well, well, I just had the two dates here and I did the math in my head. So well, you got good. close. It's pretty good. You got better yeah. than I would have. Yeah. On February 25th, 2003, like Squaresoft, Namco told European territories and the myriad localizations they demand to go fuck themselves. Episode one of Xenosaga has much of the frustration of sophisticated humanity never been re-released. Not as part of an HD collection, not as a downloadable game on the PlayStation Network, not anywhere. Your only legal option remains the original PlayStation 2 digital versatile disc played through original hardware or a variety of PC-based emulation solutions. But Chris, episode one of Xenosaga has been adapted in a few different ways. Oh, you mean like anime? Anime is one of those adaptations. How can I guess the other one? Yes. Nintendo DS. That is correct. Okay. Xenosaga 1 and 2, which was released for the Nintendo DS in Japan in March of 2006. It combined 1 and 2 of the game's narratives into a DS game somehow for some reason. Yeah. That thing does not have a full fan translation, but there is a patch out there that renders the menus in English. I would love to play this shit one day. Yeah. Like, it seems like amongst all the fans, like, and how hardcore the Xeno community is... Obviously, I can't do it because I don't have the ability, but like with all fucking Racing Lagoon got a localization, yeah. we live in a universe that birthed the wrong thing. Occasionally. Can please someone do free labor so that <laughs> yes. I can compliment you with your Patreon and make this happen as a reality for me. Mm-hmm. Through some North American retailers, pre-ordering Xenosaga Episode 2 got you a bonus disc with all of the cutscenes from Xenosaga Episode 1. Mm-hmm. Chris, how long do you think those horribly compressed cutscenes are? How long is the Xenosaga movie on the bonus disc? Seven hours and seven minutes. It is 288 minutes, almost five hours long. Wow. Which is still, you know, cut down from the 15 hours of story in the game already. There is also Xenosaga the Animation, a 12-episode anime series produced by Toei that originally aired in 2005. It was dubbed into English by 80 Vision and released through the Anime Network in 2007. The full series is now on YouTube, and I think that's going to compose some of our bonus content this season. Yes, at least going to be one of the first things that we cover. I don't yeah. know how long that will take or what else we have planned. That's definitely going to be on the docket. Lastly, we cannot forget about Xenosaga Freaks on the PlayStation 2. Yes. The Japan-exclusive collection of Xenogears Ephemera that most prominently featured the visual novel-like Xenokami sequences for most of the original game's cast. A lot of Xenokami has been adapted into English by... Kare Rico and Xenochat's Jintoki. You can download it to your personal computer. Oh, I love computers. He says that, but he doesn't love me. Oh, did you say Xenochat? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Xenochat is a great community slash podcast that covers all the Xeno games, Xeno Gears, Xeno Saga, and Xeno Blade Chronicles. So uh, check them out on the internet. Xenochat, the podcast. As of April 2023, complete inbox PlayStation 2 copies of Xeno Saga Episode 1 in English are around $30 on secondary markets. If you want to go disc only, give me that raw optical data. You're looking at $15. Wow. Xenosaga Freaks can be purchased for about 25 bucks, and that bonus disc with all the cutscenes on it is like five bucks on eBay. Oh. Or just watch it on YouTube because we live in the future. Chris, what does Der Vilsermacht mean? The will to power. Frederick Wilhelm mm, Nietzsche's concept of the will to power is that all living beings have a natural drive to dominate and exert their will over others and that social and religious constructions of morality interfere with and oppose this drive. Nietzsche maintained that actions taken in the furtherance of this desire for conquest were not evil or wrong, simply an affirmation of nature, and that the greatest human would be the one who surpassed societal morality and fully embraced the will to power. I don't know much about Nietzsche, or I've never, I've never analyzed Nietzsche or, or read anything about him. I was going to say, is that true? That's what I'm getting at. Is what you just said, could one consider that being fucked up it seems fucked up to me it kind of seems aggressively libertarian yeah aggr- like why is anybody standing in my way to assume my own power over my environment why 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 does someone not let me dominate it's everything aggressively it, it's aggressively aggressive libertarian yeah like it's not only aggressively libertarian the actor here is an aggressive libertarian yeah i think i mean the absence of morality kind of just hammers that home is not like the yeah. absence but i mean it's a philosophical concept so of course we can go back and forth about what the fuck this means for like three hours which i'm sure we will over the course of this show yeah but i should definitely get up on my nietzsche i think this game caused me to buy that book i never read it though or that's a, d- a document you've played the game now read the document <laughs> <laughs> that's true development team yeah made by 70 human beings a number that includes part-timers and contractors Cool. 20 of which, according to Tetsuya Takahashi, worked on Xenogears. Chris, who's Tetsuya Takahashi? Tetsuya Takahashi, a former Squaresoft employee who left Squaresoft, which 
I guess based on what we've learned over the course of doing this podcast must have been a bad place to work. Yeah. In an interview with GameSpot's Ike Sato, Takahashi said, A few years ago, Square was already planning to focus primarily on the Final Fantasy series. I personally did not favor the idea, and at the same time, such plans can possibly lead to big losses for the company. So I decided to leave Square and started seeking a company which our team can work with in creating a game that we desire. That company turned out to be Namco. So with a mutual understanding in developing this game, Monolith Software was established. To me, that reads as Square was burning down the house with spirits within, so Namco opened their doors so I could burn down their house too. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Didn't into the house of Tekken. Pre-production started in 1998 or 99 with the game's full production by fall of 2001. Do you know what the game was referred to before it was uh, officially titled Xenosaga? What was it? Project X. That's right. X is for Zeno, Chris. Yeah, I think so. Do you have its budget? Do you want to guess what this game's budget was? I'll guess $7.7 million. That's the correct figure, Chris. <laughs> yes. Remember, this was also the dawn of a new generation of hardware where developers were contending with software development kits as often as they were contending with the design of the game. Mm-hmm. For comparison's sake, I tried to find the production budget for Xenogears, and the only thing I could come up with was an unsourced Reddit post that said $2 million. $7.7 million in the context of today's AAA development seems like pennies. Yeah, shit ain't shit. Yeah. Final Fantasy X, Xenosaga's closest peer, had a production budget of $32.3 million. Okay, I was going to guess 25, but there you go. Yeah. Okay. So that's in that had a team of exceeding 100 people. So easily, Final Fantasy X had a budget four times that of Xenosaga. Yeah. The question Takahashi got all the time then, and the question people ask all the time now, is Xenosaga a sequel to Xenogears? Takahashi's first answer to that question that I can find was in the fall of 2001 in that GameSpot interview. He said, With our relation between Square, I think it is difficult for us to say it is a direct sequel or a prequel. It's probably more suitable to say that it follows the direction and style of Xenogears. That quote in itself is loaded. It can either read as a denial or a winking, Like, we sure can't say due to legal reasons. You know, who knows? But Chris, I don't think it's related. I have always thought of Xenosaga as a fresh slate from the same collection of artists. It's driven by some of the same principles, but expressed through a different story. Of course, there is some overlap, some whiffs of Xenogears, but it is ultimately a different story with different characters. I agree with that, but I often wonder if the full project would have come to pass, all six episodes, because this was originally announced as a six six game project project if we would have maybe found even more bits of lore and information that yeah. tied it back to Xenogears. Because there is stuff that feels like started from an origin point and stuff that is like, no, that's just, that's a fucking Zohar. They just call it a Zohar. Yeah. It's a fucking Zohar. Yeah. Uh-huh. I in agree. This, in the same interview, Takahashi goes on to say, though there are familiar faces that serve as important characters in Xenosaga, others are more like self-parodies. So we really don't want Xenogears fans to overreact. Like movies, sometimes you have the director of the movie or a friend of the leading actor appearing as cameos. So it's similar to that. My mind there first went to Vandercom, above everything. Yeah. (laughs) Episode 1's narrative and story were, of course, handled by Takahashi and his wife, Kaori Tanaka, also known as... Soria Saga. She had also worked on story and characters for Xenogears, as well as the graphic designs for Final Fantasy V and VI and Romancing Saga III. She would go on to co-author the script for Xenosaga Pied Piper and Soma Bringer, Saga also works some on Xenosaga Episode 2, but we don't need to open that can of worms today or possibly ever. But in a 2010 interview with Spencer at Silicon Era, Soria Saga was, of course, also asked about the game's connection to Xenogears, and I like her answer the best. Quote, I think all Xeno works are, so to speak, like rivers and lakes that once sprung from our mind, eventually becoming independent. They sure are kin, but not lineal. I like that too. That's really good. Yeah. 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 It's all from, it's like a pool of ideas. Yasuyuki Hone worked as art director, who was also the art director for Xenogears and Chrono Cross, and would go on to direct both Biden Kato's games on GameCube. He would also contribute art to Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Human or humanoid character designs were handled by Kuniko Tanaka and Koichi Mugitani. Tanaka also handled character designs in Xenogears and went on to work on characters in three or four Xenoblade games, as well as the Xeno Chrono adjacent unicorn Sands of Destruction. The Xenosaga trilogy was Mugitani's first of three games, and he later worked on mech designs for Xenoblade Chronicles X and blade designs for Xenoblade Chronicles 2. And here's a gem, Chris. Yeah. Mugitani also worked on the mech designs and was assisted by Junya Ishigaki. Ishigaki did mech designs for Xenogears and went on to do designs for mechs for the other two Xenosaga games, as well as Mirage design for something called World of Final Fantasy. Yes. Xenogears is in World of Final Fantasy, right? Yep. So is the only canon pronunciation of Kistis which isn't what I just said. Oh, great. Awesome. 
Mugatani also interviewed Takahashi for his book, Cosmos Fix, which was published in 2022. Oh. Lugal Banda translated it for the Xenogears Xenosaga study guide. Here is a gem from that interview. When discussing Cosmos's first draft design, Mugatani asked Takahashi, I think you requested something like Robo Girl in bondage type outfit. But was that really necessary for the plot director? Isn't that just one of your personal fetishes? Takahashi replied, I did have my conviction, so to speak, but one day I just decided that Cosmos should swing whichever way the wind was blowing, which meant market-wise, according to the localizer. Quote, so I just said screw it and went as extreme as I could. And so I think I gave you pics of one of my favorite adult film actresses. Sometimes it's important to defy your personal wishes and just stick with what you think will work. If you get a character design that you like in spite of your personal convictions, the results shouldn't disappoint. I think that was an important lesson I learned from that. Chris, I need to know the adult film actress in question for research. Yeah, you can find us on Twitter at Retroamnesia Pod. Just write us if you know. That's right. Yeah. If, if you've studied these films. Yes. It, that answer kind of reminds me of, I believe there was some interview that Surya Saga gave for Xenogears when talking about the character design for Ellie yeah. and how she said that it was Takahashi's ideal woman. Hmm. And... His that, ideal woman wears a Formula One suit. Got it. That's kind of weird for your wife to say that, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm it's getting some, at some here. problematic shit here. I mean, yeah. you know, you wonder if these characters are like deeply designed by like a panel of experts or it's just some guy in an office horny like, hey, you know what porn star I like? Make her look like that. I mean, I think that's how it works, right? Yeah, that's, like, yeah. The that, director that's gives the some works. sort of broad direction and then- and The then artist they, interprets it as- Yeah, they come back with whatever, yeah. Takahashi goes on to say that Cosmos' design was influenced by Hans Bulmer- a German artist and doll designer who was known for spherical, ball-jointed dolls, as well as generally gruesome art style. Look it up. The music, lastly, is handled by... Yasunori Mitsuda? Ding. It's beefy at 42 tracks. The London Philharmonic Orchestra was contracted to perform some pieces, along with the London-based Metro Voices Choir for accompanying vocal arrangements. Cool. Joanne Hogg, she of Small Two of Pieces, returned to perform vocals for the songs Pain and Kokoro. She has a great voice. Yeah, it's pretty good. I like it. Holds up too in those, uh, that Xenogears live performance. Mm-hmm. So something that you'll notice as you play the game is there's not a lot of themes in this game. Most of the music Mitsuda composed is played during cutscenes. Yep. Leaving only two battle themes and four area themes for actual ass gameplay. Chris, how do you think you'll feel about this? Well, Eric, while this game doesn't have very many themes, it's got a lot of themes. That's right. It's a great answer. <laughs> Thanks. I remember being uh, initially disappointed that there wasn't any background music when you're traversing, especially early in the game. That's all I've played so far. But I've, in my older age, I've become a fan of air conditioning noises and white noise. And that's exactly what I think it is. And that's what it is. Yeah, I've captured I've been, several versions of it. Too. Yeah. I've been playing it mostly with these headphones on here so I can hear it very... And sometimes I think that I've left the microphone on yeah. and, I can, and I'm hearing my own air conditioner. So I mute the microphone. I'm like, oh no, that's the air conditioner of the, of the goddamn battleship. I'd be curious if the Foley artist just captured an air conditioner for most of this. I wouldn't be surprised. The liner notes for the OST were translated by Ben Schwartzweitzer and can be found at squareenixmusic.com. In that, Mitsuda talks about how the first recording session in February 2001 went horribly and had a devastating effect on his confidence to the point where he almost contracted someone else to perform the orchestration from his compositions. To get his confidence back, quote, I took out and poured over the reference books I hadn't used since my school days, listened to dozens of classical CDs every day, and stared at the full orchestra scores until holes developed in them. I lived that way for half a month. Humans are mysterious in that they can at some point adjust to living in such a manner. Doing so, one of the things could be worse. With a desire to write music and the assimilation of the information I had crammed in during that last half month, ideas then came to me one after another. I put them into the computer for the time being, and while listening, I came to want to hear them played by a real orchestra. I escaped these fears by resolving to not run away, but stand up and face forward. I had to take responsibility for all of my failures. Furthermore, this kind of chance would never come again. I felt I had to do the arrangements myself. Even if I failed and came to regret it, and by overcoming these hardships, I feel that all of the pieces here retain my individuality and that I have taken one step into new territory. I once again felt that I was glad I did not run away. In those same liner notes, Takahashi talks about how with each passing console generation and graphics technology, Mitsuda's music still exceeds the visual presentation. So Takahashi was really happy with what Mitsuda turned. And I agree with that. Like PS2 looks state of the art in 2003 or two, but now it's like, mm. Yeah. 
he said the same thing about Mitsuda's work in Xenogears. Like he would put a scene together and then not be not. I mean, that's still true too. Not 100% sure if it would work. And then once the music was overlaid, then it transformed the scene. And I think that's still true in this game because there's some really heavy lifting that Mitsuda does, yeah. especially early on in the game. The OST was released in 2004 with new arrangements because the first version was out of print. Mm hmm. Now let's talk about promotional media. Oh, I love promotional media. In North America, Zeno Saga Episode 1 had a video trailer on the demo disc for the March 2003 issue of OPM. Who was on the cover of that issue, Chris? March what? 2003? March 2003. Here's a big hint. You've seen him perform live. I've seen him perform. Billy Corgan. Method Man. <laughs> that was my next guess. For, for Def Jam Vendetta. A point of clarification here. Yeah. I saw Method Man perform at E3. That's right. E3 2010 with Red Man. Rest in peace, E3. Hopefully, Method Man and Red Man are still alive. Yeah, they're, they're, they're still uh, with us. Okay, first. okay, just making sure. That video is a little over two minutes, opening with CG cutscenes in the first half, leaving the second half for gameplay captures of sick battle attacks. Mm -hmm. Xenosaga had no public playable demo, as best I can tell. It also had a 30 second commercial in North America. Did you see this? No. A white guy student knocks on the door of his professor's office. His professor's name, by the way, is Dr. Misuda. Oh, that guy. He enters the empty and very messy office and finds an ornate metal plate on the doctor's desk. Yeah. It's the same shit they dig up in the opening cutscene. There's a conspicuous Zohar-shaped piece missing from the center of this plate. My dude then reveals he's wearing a Zohar-shaped necklace, which he removes and inserts into the plate. Oh. The plate lights up. All the clocks in the office stop moving. Then we get 10 seconds of CG action footage from the game. It ends with the light going out in the professor's office and the voiceover. Let the saga take you. Chris, my dude got troned into the game. He did. He let the saga take him. And if you'll note that Dr. Masuda is the doctor from yes. the opening CG cutscene. Right. In Japan, oh boy, Zeno Saga got two 15 second commercials. One, which I should not have watched at work, depicts a newborn baby dick out being placed in a nursery with other screaming babies. The camera then pulls out to reveal footage from the game. What do you think that means? life uh begins here be the saga is taking the child the saga is taking here the realians uh, have the mental maturity of an infant's good good point let's listen to those 15 seconds uh, i don't want to rpg <laughs> The other commercial is a 15 seconds of voiceover, which I can't understand because I don't speak Japanese with footage from the game. Here's that 15 seconds. <laughs> Zenosaga also got a print ad in the February 2003 issue of Game Pro. It's got Shion, Cosmos, and Albedo encircling a massive monolithic Zohar in the text, Destiny's so big, the universe can barely contain them. Oh. Chris, do you power rank that above or below Stand Tall and Shake the Heavens? Oh, that's below. You think so? Stand Tall and Shake the Heavens, you don't forget that. Yeah. What you just read, you've already forgotten. I've already forgotten it. I just <laughs> looked down on my notes to see it again. <laughs> yes. It also has five screenshots, all from CG cutscenes. Xenosaga would get a second Greatest Hits magazine ad when the price dropped to 20 bucks a year later. Another ad at the time just featured Cosmos in battle mode over a Zohar emblem with the text, Somewhere in the vastness of space, mankind's fate rests with one of its creations. Let the saga take you. Chris, what sagas have taken you? Saga by Brian K. Vaughn. I'm like 90% of the way through the that. The comic. It's good, isn't it's pretty it? Pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty fucking good. What other sagas have taken me? Does it have to have saga in the title? It does. Okay. Can you help me out here? Panzer Dragoon Saga, Panzer available Dra at patreon.com slash retroam, our fourth miniseries. You ever get into the saga frontiers, Chris? I, I ran to the Saga Frontiers. They did not take me. No. No. Did you ever romance a saga? Never romanced a saga. Is the Ogre Battle Saga a saga? Because I you, think it's called the Ogre Battle Saga, sure. like unofficially. Is that your chosen saga? Can then? the Ogre Battle Saga take me? We'll see in season six. Contemporary. The Metal Gear Saga. Yeah, the Saga of Solid Snake. Yeah. It's a saga. I mean, anything's a saga if you concentrate hard enough. Contemporary reviews. Everyone's favorite part. GamePro gave it a 4.5 from Star Dingo, which I guess they were still calling the editors that shit in 2000. Star Dingo? Star Dingo. Star Dingo. I couldn't find out who that actually was. I tried. Quote, Zeno Saga is an interstellar outer space opus of the most magnificent kind, an intelligent and surprisingly intelligible, 
Final Fantasy styled symphony of psychotic robots, hyperspace travel, and eerie religious debates. But a warning goes out to potential spacefarers. Embark on this journey, and you'll do as much watching as you will role playing. Whoa. It's deep. Is that, <laughs> was that said with in jest, or was that just being like, this is cool? I think we'll talk about it later, but when this game came out, the cutscenes really fucking were divisive. Like yeah. how much of this game you watched was like, it was either very cool or what the fuck is this? And Metal Gear Solid 2 was out. Yes. And that's the only thing that I could think of that I had played to this point that had cutscenes. Final in Fantasy 10 had some pretty long cutscenes, but not like to, not to this kind of It didn't, it didn't, they weren't emblazoned in, in terms of like, why am I still sitting here? Yeah. There weren't save points in the middle of the Final Fantasy 10 cutscenes. <sighs> yeah. Did Metal Gear have those or did Xenosaga invent that shit? I think maybe Xenosaga. That's what I think it. too. We'll see. If you know of any other games that invented cutscene save points, twitter.com slash retro amnesia pod. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Or you want to ask the fake net? Yeah, I'd like to research that. Go ahead. <laughs> push sure? the button. I yeah. don't have to press the button. Push the fucking button. Initializing fake net. I don't know. My database appears to only contain instances of gamers complaining about cutscene length in Metal Gear Solid 4 and Persona 5. Thank you, fake net. You look like ice cream that already melted. GameSpot, reviewed by Supergiant Games, Greg Kasavin, gave it an 8.1 out of 10. Oh. Greg said Xenosaga is an original and memorable entry into the genre that's been mostly stagnant for years now. And the game is clearly a labor of love, filled with many intense and remarkable moments. And that's more than enough to recommend it to anyone looking for a truly great role-playing game. IGN Imagine Games Network, reviewed by Jeremy Dunham. Mm -hmm. Xenosaga is a deeply enriching thrill ride towards the cosmos. This epic space opera is truthfully described as a member of the PlayStation 2's elite RPG club. Wow. Not without a few gameplay to cinema pacing problems, Dervils are mocked can still stand toe-to-toe with the best of them. And what's most exciting of all is that it's only the beginning of something much larger to come. Finally, EGM 164 in March of 2003. We have this one thanks to Adrian of the Retrograde Amnesia Discord, who scanned his old magazine after I could not find one on the internet. Oh, wow. Real net coming through. Lexington, Kentucky, Shane Bettenhausen gave it an 8. Greg Seward gave it a 6.5. And Gary gave it an 8. Thanks, Gary. Just Sh- Gary? Just Gary. Just Gary. All right. Shane called it, quote, a revolutionary epic storyline that redefines what we've come to expect from game narrative. I've never had so much fun not playing a game. Also note that every reviewer was, quote, freaked out by the cutscene to game ratio in the review. Yeah. Lastly, let's talk about my favorite award show of all time. Is it the one with Hulk Hogan? Spike VGA Awards? Yes, it is, yes. Chris. Where are the gamers at? At the first ever Spike VGAs in 2003, Xenosaga Episode 1 was nominated for Best Fantasy Game and Best Animation. Okay. What games beat it, Chris? What games do you think ruled fantasy and animation in 2003? Star Wars. Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic won Best Fantasy Game, but what won Best Animation? Uh, 2003. I don't know. Sly Cooper? Close. Imagine that you're a pervert. Okay. Leisure Shoot Larry. You're close. You're very close. What uh, Xbox exclusive? Uh, BMX Triple X. <laughs> Dead or Alive Extreme Beach, Beach Volleyball yes. won Best Animation. I read that actually and I forgot to write it down. There Did you go. Did you look up what took home Game of the Year at the first ever Spike VGA Awards? Yeah, but I don't remember. Madden NFL 2004. Oh, okay. What did it beat? Do you have to run her up? Game of the Year. No, I don't. Okay. Wow. Fake Net, what did it beat? Initializing Fake Net. SOCOM2 US Navy SEALs, SSX3, Star Wars Galaxies, Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell, and Tony Hawk's Underground. Memories. Before I get to mine, Chris, how about you tell me yours? Yeah, my personal history with Xenosaga, uh-huh. you mean? Let the saga take me for you. D- <laughs> yes. Yeah, that adds up. I, I think it that works. works. Okay. I think I remember exactly where I was when I read the news about Monolith Soft becoming a thing. Hell yeah. And there being like a new spiritual successor to Xenosaga. Initializing fake net. Crisp means a spiritual successor to Xenogears. Also, while I am making corrections, Bandai merged with Namco in 2006, not 2003 as Eric stated 25 minutes ago. But I need you to tell me if I'm right, if my memories serve me right. Most of our communication in 2002, 2003 was on AIM because you had gone away to school. Okay, so I feel like I was in the first dorm, the one with the bunk beds. Yeah. With the anime posters. Mm Mm-hmm. With the Mountain Dew can wall, yes, <laughs> yes that Mount, one. Yeah, Mount, yeah, that refrigerator over there that's in this podcast it's studio, 25 letters, yep, yeah. There it is. Well, that's where I read the news at, probably. Monolith Soft being formed before that, but... I feel like that when the news caught me... When the know, saga took you. Yeah, when the saga began to take me, so... I was extremely amped after reading about that, and the split from Squaresoft. But, yeah, like we said, the important fact 
about this is that when Xenosaga came out, I lived in a college dorm with our friend Josh. We both were Xenogears fans, and we both were about to be taken by the saga. And I often refer to this portion of my life as like the era of anime DVDs. Mm. Like I had lots of anime DVDs. It was in the early aughts, going to Best Buy on payday and picking up one DVD at least was a ritual almost. Yeah, yeah. Suncoast Video, Sam Goody, all those kind of places. So I feel like I was primed to enjoy a game like this because yeah. it was an, this is basically it was an, an anime DVD. It's an anime DVD basically. At that point in time, I think also I, I very much needed something to fuck with me as much as Evangelion did. Yes. You know, how old, am, how old are we at this point in time? 20, 20, 21. Yeah, something like that. So it was a day one purchase. I probably couldn't afford it. You know, I had the money to buy it, but I probably shouldn't. Frivolous have purchase. Yeah, I probably skipped class, probably skipped work. Like I went to go get that shit on that day. You know how like when you're in college in a dorm and you like put the sock on the door to say, don't come in here, I'm fucking. Yeah, I'm fucking, or, right. Or, <laughs> the dick's out. Do, yeah. do not enter. Yeah. Well, we did that with Zeno Saga. Dude. So... So you didn't see each other's cutscenes? So we wouldn't see spoilers, yeah. You only had one TV in that dorm, right? Yeah, yeah. One CRT. And so we had to you had to play Zeno Saga when your roommate was at class or at oh work or God. whatever. Oh my God. Yeah, it was, so it was weird. And so you, and you definitely, because you want this thing to fuck with you in a linear fashion. I want to bring that up, actually. Like, yeah. searching out media that fucks with you was like a quest because you were just, because DVD made video accessible in ways that it really hadn't been before. Yeah. And like, that's when I discovered David Lynch films and shit like that. Yeah. Just stuff that like, can mess your mind up, yeah. man. You weren't there because you hadn't seen Evangelion, but when, when we first got a hold of a copy of the end of Evangelion, it was a bootleg DVD, I think from China or something that we got in eBay. Like back when you had to like send a check to somebody when you bought something on eBay. Yes. And it had English subtitles, but they were really bad. But we still watched it anyway after finishing the series because we were watching it progressively as, as it was re-released on DVD. This was like, you know, like eight dudes that were all like 19, you know? All crammed in one dorm? No, no, no. This was before, this was just before college. Okay, or or yeah, at, least, yeah. at least that we were back. We all were, crammed in one basement? We were at my parents' house. And after that movie ended, several people just left and just ran down the street, ran oh, into the yes. woods and shit. Yes, that was yeah. the era of uh, yeah. running freakouts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I don't think I saw anyone else do in our group of friends until you ran around the block after eating a really hot sauce. Yeah, like, that, couple, that was how, you yeah. know, I needed to get the energy out yeah. somewhere. yeah. So anyway, like, Zeno Saga was the most important thing to ever happen at that point in time, yes, right? I agree completely. Zeno yeah. Saga, when it came out, was the most important thing to ever happen like, in my life. Yeah, this was the shit that was going to fuck me up forever and change my life. Like, fuck me up, Takahashi, please. And I wanted, yes, I wanted more of it, and I wanted it to take me to a new place. But and there are scenes in this game that I still, that like, absolutely delivered on that promise. Absolutely, and I think it's funny now, because when you start to look at this game now, you're, you look at the characters and their propensity to fail in their lives. Yeah. And in 2003, in terms of my life, my wheels were spinning. I wasn't accomplishing anything. I was just at school, not accomplishing anything at all. And failure was just an abundant resource, resource in my life. And plenty of it to go around. And I don't even think I picked up on those kind of thematic elements of the game when I was playing it, because I was so fucking close to failure at, at that point in time. I think ultimately I didn't get what I wanted from it because I never, because like when Zeno Saga 2 came out, I was just like, I'll wait and borrow it from Eric or something, you know? Uh-huh. Like it was not, it did not emblaze it into me like the way Zeno Gears did. I mean, or well, did. Zeno Saga 2 had the unfortunate circumstance of coming out very close to Tekken 5, which was yes. the other game people in our friend group were obsessed with. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's, that's what true. happened there. Yeah. That's my personal history with Zeno Saga, Eric. That's impressive, Chris. I love the point you brought up about media that fucks you up. Yeah. So I had played Zeno Gears in the spring of 99. It was my second ever RPG. Xenogears did something special to my brain as it did to all of your brains. We all share the same infection. The earliest I remember hearing about the follow-up to Xenogears came as part of my daily check-ins with RPGFan.com. Yeah. And I actually managed to find the news story posted by Cameo on October 22nd, 1999. Okay. It was an on-the-record quote from the newly formed Monolith Soft art director, Kunihiko Tanaka, who was also the art director of Xenogears. Tanaka had said a sequel to Xenogears was pitched at Square, but it didn't work out. But their new project will have aspects similar to Xenogears, but not actually have anything to do with Xenogears. Wink. There, even though I was deeply immersed in Final Fantasy VIII that fall at that time when I read that, I started my near daily search of scouring forums and websites for more information and additional speculation on that project. Then I kind of don't remember much else until launch. I have a memory of getting my car repaired in early January of 2003 after I forgot to put the parking brake on and it crashed in my neighbor's house. Yeah. That one. 
And I walked across the street from the body shop to Kmart and I bought the February 2003 issue of EGM and read Shane Bettenhausen's preview of the English version of the game. Wow. I also remember reading that Xenogears, that like Xenogears, Xenosaga was only a piece in a much larger story, mm. which is a reference the first of six or was it the first of five? It was the first of six. And one thing I got from, from the, the Xenogears and Xenosaga study guide, which I'm sure we'll reference. It's a, oh, yeah. It's a website. Wonderful resource. Uh, was that the original Xenogears Perfect Work series was... It was also six. It was also six, but it was grouped differently. Like the first episode was Mankind in Space. But it had talked about leaving Earth behind in Perfect Works as well. Yes, yes. The grouping of the episodes was going to be like one, and then in the middle group, it was two, three, four. Oh, right. And then five and six at the end. Yes, yes, yes. But they retooled it for Xenosaka, and it was going to be one and two Mankind in Space. Three and four is kind of like phase world, for lack of a better term. Yeah. And then five and six were going to be what comes next, whereas episode five in the Xenogears Perfect Works was originally part of that middle section. So they, the thing about plans and game development is nothing really goes according to plan. No, kind of, kind I mean, like it. Halo Infinite's not going to be infinite. Dude, no, it's not. <laughs> they're they're going to cut that thing off as soon as they possibly can. Yeah. It said it was going to be a six game story told over 10 years that would span console generations. Do you I, know how exciting that sounds? Dude, um, I remember talking to our buddy Nick about that and feeling the sheer horror taking over us when we realized we wouldn't know the end of the Xeno saga until we were 30 years old that's old as fuck eric it's an age that was impossible to imagine when we were both 19 and i'm 39 now, right now by the way and yeah you know, fuck me right yeah and it, what your birthday's what august right yeah mm-hmm. so you so you're you'll, you'll be turning 40 days after this podcast hits the free feed eric oh, man so oh, happy God. birthday Eric! not if i die first <laughs> <laughs> but i was there day one i pre-ordered a babbage's and oxmoor mall because it came with a free zeno saga shirt that i kept until 2015 and then I came home and I played the shit out of that video game. My memories are composed of the interminable cutscenes, which at the time I'd never seen anything like. Games didn't go that far, not Metal Gear Solid 2 or Final Fantasy X. Xenosaga really earned its reputation as a more movie than game. And I remember, I'm not going to say what it is, but I remember there being, in like, kind of referencing Chris's quest for fucked up in this, there's a scene with Albedo that I had to message you all on AIM, be like, have you seen this yet? Have yeah. you seen this yet? Have you seen the Albedo scene yet? Over and over again. Yeah. My other outstanding memory is the Song of Nephilim musical track because that just haunted my brain Mm -hmm. for so long. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that one was really reused. And I remember being enchanted by the winks and nods to Xenogears. I remember that when I was done, there was no game I wanted more than Xenosaga Episode 2, which was only two years away. The fiction sold me and I was all in to see it through, but it was also different than Xenogears, mostly because I played it in college when I was a mature adult of 19 and actively taking a philosophy course and not a high school dumb boy of 15 years old. (laughs) Yeah struggling with geometry. Talking about Nietzsche and the will to power while also playing through Xenosaga was fucking crazy. Everyone else in my philosophy class was comparing what we were learning to the Matrix. Not me, son. No. I knew about Xenosaga. Yeah. Also, I want to talk about the Damarong incident. Mm -hmm. Damarong. The Damarong is a a ship in this. Yeah. I believe it's a Wilhelm ship. Damarong. And me and our buddy Nick could not remember what that was called. So Nick wrote it on the wall of the place where we both worked. Oh. It is still there. Is it really? It still says Damarong on the wall. Wow, that's amazing. It's in a maintenance closet. My other memory is, whoa, Ziggy sure looks like David Bowie. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ziggy, Ziggy Stardust, some may yeah. call him. Yeah. And, and that's all I got for memories. It's funny you, when you gave your vivid description of when you went to go buy the game or whatever, like after yeah. in your car or whatever. Do you remember that parking lot down the street from the dorm, like at the football stadium that we had to park at? Yes, and, and walk then, the whole and, fucking... And it was a long fucking yeah. walk. I specifically remember walking back from that parking lot with... Did you have the manual out? Uh, Tekken 4, and then also with Xenosaga, like that nice. same kind of... Uh, was that the same year? Tekken 4, we bootlegged it in summer of 2002. I think it would come out... That sounds pretty close. Yeah, Okay. I remember specifically skipping philosophy class to get Tekken 4. Dude, if Namco keeps putting Tekken out next to Xenosaga, what the fuck are the... That's... No, you can't do that. No. I'm in both markets. Chris, how the goddamn hell are we playing this game in 2023? Well, Eric, I have a PlayStation 2 here sitting below my desk that is hooked up to a RetroTink 5X that is connected to uh, this monitor, a capture card, and this monitor. So I'm playing it with two monitors. That's right. So that this I is can, God intended. So it, I, my neck, if it hurts this way, I can look this way. But you uh, are playing off original hardware. Yes, but you have uh, provided me with a free boots McFadden. What's it called? Free McBoot. <laughs> free McBoot. 
Free McBoot. That is a program that can r- launch the open PlayStation Loader software where you can load PlayStation 2 games off of a hard drive. Yes, yes. I made that for Chris during our Xenogear season, assuming that we'd, pl- we'd be playing Xenosaga next and then just left that PS2 here. Yeah, it's still here. It's been waiting for Chris for four years. The Mr. Mosquito disc image is actually Midnight Club. Yeah, I'm well, still upset. <laughs> that, was, that was fucked up. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. I put all the essentials on there. You know, Shadow the Hedgehog, so Code in 3, everything you need for a PlayStation 2. On a 60 gigabyte hard drive I bought in 2008. So next question, what are we counting in this game? We've previously had the Parasite Eve Ashtray count, the Final Fantasy VIII Chicken Wuss count. The Chrono Cross Toilet count. Toilet count, and then the War Crimes count of Suikoden and Suikoden 2. Suikoden 1 had the Invisible Hand of Destiny count. Oh, right, yes. Suikoden 2 had War Crimes. What are we forgetting here? We didn't count for Terra Enigma. What did we count? Did we count anything in in, uh, Star Star Ocean? I don't know. I don't think we did. These things happen. Oh, well. We're going to count two things this time. We are? Okay. Well, the one thing... Oh, I didn't know that. We are going to count... The Xenosaga Catholic schoolboy activation phrase. Yes, count. Chris and I both went to Catholic schools and are thus are triggered by certain religious references and information <laughs> yeah. that give us flashbacks. Yeah. My priest died in jail. Catholic schoolboy activation. We're also going to count the whiffs of Xenogears. Whiffs of Xenogears, okay. We get a whiff of Xenogears. Okay. What uh, is a whiff? That's up to you. Okay. But we can get whiffs. You know when you smell a fart and you're like, that has to be that? And you can tell if it's like your kid fucked up or your dog fucked up? It's not like that. It's just all Xenogears. Okay, good. Because I, I didn't know we were doing that because I was going to ask you if activation phrases can also be Xenogears references, but this works. They can be the same. We, okay. we can, they can, they can function. Both sound effects that I haven't even made yet will be played. Okay. But, but I need two post-it notes to keep track of it though, right? Okay. Yeah. We should do that rather than just me have to remember it every time. And we forget start, and yeah. We started doing that with Warcraft here. I'm going to get the post-it notes there out now. There's, there's the post that's going to live on Chris's monitor for the next 18 months or however long this shit takes. Expectations. Expe- what expectations do you have for this game? Now? What do you want? from Zeno Saga. I want Tetsuya Takahashi to fuck me up. <laughs> it's just the same as it was it's 20 the, years ago. It's the same as it was, but now I'm an adult who wants to be fucked up. Like I want to be, I don't necessarily care about the nature of, of humanity and what's the secret of, what is the secret? What is the secret? What was the thing they had said about Xenogears? The, where mankind has been and where, where it's we're, going? We're, we're going. I don't yeah. give a shit about any of that. <laughs> I want to know about what it's like to be a failure as an adult. Because most of the characters in this game are adults, right? Yeah, well, I, technically. I want to I mean, know. They're anime adults. I want to know what, what it's like to have an existential crisis at the end of the world. Because I already have existential crises. Yeah, but um, I don't you know, almost think weekly. The world does seem like it's going to end, but it's probably not going to end, right? Yeah. Um, On a local level, it's so, very well could. Yeah. yeah, but I want that kind of energy. I want there to be things that I want this game to reveal new things to me. Xenogears kind of did. It was those messages were kind of uplifting and positive when it came when, yeah. it, when it comes to like the endings were very the positive. Concept of the two one winged angels and right. all that kind of stuff. I want that, but in the opposite. I want I want to be rubbed into the dirt. My face to be rubbed into the dirt by Tetsuya Takahashi. That's what I want. And I think there's something different about being a young and ambitious child boy playing this game and not really knowing how the world works, and then kind of being a cynical, jaded fuck, which you can really slip into as you approach 40 years old. Yes. Like, I think that gap of time, like taking a 20 year break between the saga is, I think, valuable for perspective. Yes. Because yes. I haven't, have you ever replayed this game? No. Me neither. No. I've looked at like random cutscenes here and there. Yeah. For my expectations, I want to see what Takahashi and the rest of his team obviously can do with a fully 3D world and a fully movable camera. We got traces of it in Xenogears. That's why he said he went with sprites on Polygon because yeah. he wanted to move the camera. But now it's time to see if Monolith is, is as obsessed with cinematic framing as Koji Pro. I'm also curious if I will respond to the narrative or if I will drown in it like I did with the Xenoblade games, where I only really held on for the first one before disengaging somewhere in the middle. One thing that I've noticed early on in this game, and this is more of a broad observation, but I don't know what it is about the way the dialogue is written or how it's, how it's presented, but in-game when you're walking around talking to NPCs, yeah. I'm enjoying that hundreds of times more than I enjoy any of that shit in the Xenoblade games. I don't, yeah. like, I don't like talking to anybody in the Xenoblade games. No. I'm like, please don't talk to me. Please don't tell me to go get anything. Please stop. Stop it. Stop doing this. And that's not an indictment. <laughs> that's not an indictment of the localization because I think they're pretty good in both games, but it seems like all of this one was written more with intention to build a narrative rather than to funnel you to go get seven t- adamantoid car- carapaces. To, uh, to yeah. Go. Yes. I think that's the wrong game, but seriously, it doesn't but, matter. You know, know what the fuck I'm talking. Just yes. go give me five glowy bits from that cave. Yeah. The game. 
video game. We place that DVD inside of our PlayStation 2, then we hear that sweet PS2 boot sequence. Finally, the anime. Is this your first anime on DVD experience? I think so. Okay. Like Kyle, I had seen some Evangelion, but those are the tapes that he lifted from Suncoast. Yeah. The main menu. If Sorry, had, they were going to go out of business. Anyway. No, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. He, was, he was accelerating the uh, demise of Suncoast. The main menu, if you let it idle, kicks out to the Namco screen and then a sky of black clouds that tear open, revealing MSI, Monolith Soft Interactive, the Monolith logo, and then it kickbacks out to the title screen. And th- what's unique about this is there's no sound effects or music, which is really neat. It reminds me of the Evangelion title cards. Yeah. It just like hits you with fucking badass shit. Yeah. No music or sound effects. Yeah. And this just loops over and over. I thought my audio was misrouted when I was doing it because I was streaming. You know what's funny is... There are glitches from running the game on off a hard drive on PS2. It's not perfect. Mm -hmm. And now I'm paranoid that since I'm doing that as well, like I had this game on disc, but I would rather save my working PS2 disc drives and play it off a hard drive. Yeah. I'm now wondering if there's supposed to be music there. (laughs) We'll see. I don't know. FakeNet, is there supposed to be music there? Initializing FakeNet. I also hear nothing. It's as cold and dark as the rest of your lives. Chris, what is the most unique thing about the press start screen? Think about Metal Gear. Think about the Japanese. You got to press circle. You press circle to confirm. Yeah, it's, taking, it's taking some time to get back to that because before mm-hmm. that was standardized. Nintendo still does that as far as button placement goes. It's still the A button is over on the far right. Yeah, but it's A. Yeah, but this is circle. Yeah. It's not X. Push the start button on the PlayStation 2 controller. CG cutscene. Music prologue plays. We open on a sweeping shot of a large body of water with land barely visible in the background. The sky is a sunny blue but cloudy, and taking in the sun's position, it appears to be the middle of the day. Text on screen, 20XXAD, Mega Man years. Yeah. AD Lake, Turkana, Kenya. And that's a real lake, and honestly, if you look up some pictures of it, it's pretty close to what this is. Yeah. The camera pans to the right to reveal a closer body of land, one defined by its barren hills. It then cuts to a dig site, three layers deep, with a few dozen dudes doing some digging. It seems like there's lots of guys. Yeah. Like, they didn't just put a handful of guys. So there's guys everywhere. And I think only guys. I did not see any women. Yeah, and this is actual CG. Most of the cutscenes in this game are video captured of in-game models, but mm-hmm. this is real CG. It's not a small site. It's actually composed of multiple excavated areas. A truck then rolls by, and it flash cuts to a makeshift site tent. Two figures emerge, and we hear the first dialogue of this game. Thanks. Concentrate on the northern cliff cliff tomorrow. The ground there is hard, so be careful when you dig. Yes, sir. Doctor! Doctor Masuda! What is it? Did you find something? Yeah. We followed the corridor from the lakeside. It matches the location described in the research paper. Good. Show us where it is. I remember playing this being like research paper. I'm supposed to be in space. What are we doing? Yeah. How's the saga going to take me on Earth? No, because this is real, Eric. Oh, yeah. This (laughs) this is real life. This is an actual space. On the planet that you live on. And guess what, Eric? You live in 20XX. I do. If I wanted to, I could actually go over to Turkana, Kenya. Yes. I needed to. Lake Turkana. As the gang takes off to find it, the worker explains more. It's different from the others. The trio continues along the excavation site. And there's a weird scene where they all have to carefully step over an electrical cord. Did you notice that was like a tech flex? No. They all take time to step over a cord. I was too busy trying to figure out if they have fingers, but I don't think they have have fingers. Maybe, Maybe Dr. Masuda does but the rest of them don't. The ones that you're not going to get close-ups on have no fingers? I mean, there's fingers, they but they're all... They're, hands. Yes, they're yeah. stuck, yeah. Mm-hmm. They're like cloud hands. Once they arrive at the Discovery, Dr. Masuda steps over it, looking relatively nonplussed. The camera lingers on Masuda's face before showing the Discovery. One thing that we also need to note about Dr. Masuda's face, this man is wearing a Y2K beanie. Yeah, like he's got that he beanie. really is, yeah. dude. Yeah. That's a good point. He's uh, in... Stocking it, cap, some call it. We're in the desert. <laughs> yeah. Mind I you. mean, you st- as, a, as a bald dude, you need to cover that head when you're outside in the harsh, barren sun, or else you're going to get some crispies up there. Okay. But, but it's it, Y2K. Yes, it is. Definitely, we are on the precipice of Y2K. So it showcases the discovery. It's a circular arrangement of designs and patterns, still covered in dust and dirt. It's impossible to tell what it is, other than it's not made by nature. Mitsuda wipes some dirt away from the crest in the center, revealing its indentation of its, what is it? It's the goddamn what? It's the goddamn Zohar. It's the fucking Zohar. It's the Zohar that we recognize from Xenogears. Are we getting whiffs? Yeah, it's like a, if you don't know what the Zohar is, actually, yeah, let's just, I, I just got a whiff. I'll have to make it a whiff. effect. Yeah. All right. Press the button. But it's just the indentation of the Zohar. A piece is missing from a wider design. Yeah, some sort of, you know... A key. Key of Nebuchadnezzar. That's right. One might call it. We already brought up the key of Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> in episode one. 
Masuda recognizes the indentation, then casually removes the clean, silver, missing Zohar-shaped piece from an unsecured pocket on the front of his shirt. Yeah. The very long-handed Dr. Masuda then inserts his crest inside its place. So one of the things that really works for me, this first section of the cutscene, I feel like the character designs here for Dr. Masuda and all the guys, they look a lot more like regular guys yeah. than anime guys. Makes this game ground its lore in real fucking life. Yeah. It makes me feel in 2003 like this could happen, like some ancient secrets can be discovered out in the desert that like, you know, like the Dead Sea Scrolls have been uncovered yeah. and somebody- we, we could do this. We could go yes. find the Zohar in Africa right now. This could happen. Like this is going to make me go buy books about Freemasons and shit. Like this is what's happening to me right now. You're going to buy, you're going to go to half price books tomorrow with Nietzsche and Freemasonry? No, I did it already. <laughs> like in the past, I, I would, I bought books about Freemason rituals and how they revealed the secret. It's all fucking bullshit. It's all like- oh, of course. Ancient aliens. But it's also cool. It's also, it's, it's all like ancient alien- adjacent stuff maybe with like less anti-semitism but like just <laughs> okay just weird shit and that's what made this game initially start working for me so well. it's like this this is real man this could happen these are the secrets this you know, is now i had to write about the dead sea scrolls because of evangelion so it's like of course you know like they those predicted that the fucking angels were going to come and the robots had to fight them that that, that, that could happen there that yeah. could happen too totally. so this could happen anyway. it's funny that you mentioned it being real because everyone here is covered in dust and dirt and that's probably an effect of it being actual actual CG and yeah. PS2 models but no one in the game that I've played thus far has any speck of dust or dirt on them they all have the clean faces mod <laughs> yes whereas yes. here like this is more earthy there's dust there's dirt there's weather everything else so far is just in a spaceship mm -hmm. the music swells the trenches of the artifacts start filling with light the centerpiece glows and the entire surface radiates green energy we hard cut back to Lake Turkana and an outline of the Zohar becomes visible below the water. Back at the dig site, the earth shakes. The workers are startled. But Dr. Masuda simply rolls back on his ass and marvels at the phenomenon. A Zohar-shaped object then ejects from the ocean, plunging Masuda back on his ass, and the seismic shock destroys more equipment at the dig site. It culminates in a truck spinning out of control and doing a 180-degree slide into the tent. I hope no one was killed. The Zohar-shaped object then finishes its rise and its trenches glow red. Dr. Masuda is shown breathing heavily, unable to believe this shit, while the people around him scramble and have panic attacks. At the Zohar's tip, another tendril-shaped object rises out of the sea. That shit glows red too. Dr. Masuda ignores all of his workers, still in obvious distress, as he stands up and collects himself. He says, whoa, as he stares at the base of the Zohar, which has effectively formed a bridge out into the middle of the sea. My dude takes one step onto that bridge, then it cuts back to its terminus where an aurora borealis explodes from space between the tip and the newer object. As the vocals swell on the music, twin beams of light shoot upward from the four points along the newest platform. The light then materializes into a golden Zohar with a blue emerald core. Slowly the Zohar gains a corporeal form as it shifts from translucent to gold. The Zohar radiates a sphere of energy, then shoots its own beam of light into the sky. Dr. Masuda comments on the light, seemingly with a hint of recognition. That light. Soon it begins to rain, like at the end of David Lynch's adaptation of Dune, Fade to Black. So, uh, is it worth talking about what Masuda thought he was looking for, or why he had that artifact with him in the first place? The research paper, Eric. The research paper if said we can to read have it, the right? research. We'll explore it later once we unlock the database, but there is actual information about this in the Zeno. Oh, you can read about it later? Yeah, yeah, you can read it Cool, I did not know. I just thought that, like, to me, it was in style at the time to open with something fucked up and then not reference it for 400 hours. See also Xenogears. Yeah, well, it actually made me think about... It's like a reverse Xenogears, honestly. The Light from the Nether. Like, that was the name of the title track, for, or the, the opening track for Xenogears, and this is literally, like, the same thing, like, where a light is... It, different circumstances, but... The Zohar's still up to its old yes, tricks. Yes, yes. And that's all before the game. So, that's it for this episode of Retrograde Amnesia. See us next time for what happens 4,000 years later. Yes, when anime becomes real. Chris, what's the real net? Hey, Eric, let's consult the real net. Initializing real net. Hello, real net. The real net is our, our, our patron, our patron f followers and whatnot. Some people call it a chat. Yeah, it's a chat that's going on during this live recording of the podcast where they leave us good ass comments and we read them. At least not all of them because there's lots, but the good ones that I notice. They're all good. The ones that you notice. Yes. 
Shyguy32 says, unfortunately, Nietzsche's sister was an ardent Nazi and edited his manuscripts to fit the party's ideology. Uh, the Will to Power in particular was published posthumously by her and therefore has the most of that shit in it. I don't know what to do with that, but I'm glad that we know that now, right? Again, we're looking for things that have substantially less anti-Semitism in them. Yes. <laughs> Soto Zaho says, the story goes that Nietzsche suffered a mental breakdown after witnessing someone whipping a horse and then spent the last decade of his life in an asylum. I can totally see seeing something out in the world that is kind of the straw that broke the camel's back that just becomes the thing you ponder for the rest of your life. Yeah. Hey, Nazuki. This like, is before, I'm one head injury away from having that happen to me about whatever. Hey, <coughs> Nazuki says, and this is before you said it, but have you all seen the Naked Baby Xenos Like a One trailer? I think it has to do with the URTV storyline like the designer children. Yeah, I'm sure. Like, it probably ties in, but what a weird thing to advertise your game. I mean, again, I'm not a part of Japanese culture, really. But Japanese have weird commercials. Again, part of the fuck me up early 2000s thing was going on the internet and finding things from Japan. That was also an avenue to do that with. Cal L bought a Stand Tall and Shake the Heavens ad out of a comic book from eBay. Nice. It's, it's good. It's good shit. I didn't mention it here, but I had a Cosmos. It was basically the box art from this wall scroll in my room ah. from like 2003 to 2005. Yes, I remember that. It's good. The Cosmos wall scroll. Yeah. Uh, Razum, the Fate Net's already told, told us this, but Razum does say that Metal Gear Solid 2 does have a uh, save point within the cutscene uh, along the approach to Arsenal Gear towards the end. So just one though? As far as... as, far as, as, yeah, as, far as, as I, far I just picture someone on Monolith playing that and go, we can just do this whenever we want. Just just put like 10 of them in there. Hey, Nuzuki says that, says, I'm pretty sure that G4 has one line in an interview where he's like, you like Xenosaga? What the fuck is your problem? Initializing fake net. It was Adam Sessler. So you like Xenosaga? Yes. What the f*** is your problem? Question mark. That fits G4's MO. Did Tommy Tallarico say that? That sounds about right. I don't know. Have you read the Biting Kaitos review? The Morgan Webb Biting Kai Kaitos review where she brought up the Great Replacement Theory. Oh. About how the Japanese are going to replace you. Oh, you should look that up. It's really fucked Everything up. Everything from G4 is embarrassing. Yes. Like, I'm, uh, that's one of my, like, proudest things is, like, I found that shit abhorrent at the time. Just, like, unwatchable. My favorite thing on G4 was the one where they would just show trailers. Oh, good. Yeah, they're just commercials. It was at night. It was just trailers. It was called Cinematech. The best way I've heard described that is it was mostly TV people who knew very little about games as opposed to game people who didn't really know much about TV. Cliff Racer says, Square doesn't want you to know this, but the Zohar and Xenogears isn't under copyright. You can put it in your game. I have 458 Zohars. <laughs> we should start selling them. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of Etsy Zohar keychains already. If I can buy the fucking Twin Peaks room key, then I can the, buy that. We'll get to it later, but one of the neat things about the database stuff is that it will tell you what the real world reference is, like what the Zohar is. Because I've this, looked that up on my own. I didn't know that was in... Because okay. this game is real. This yeah. game takes place in the real world. This game tries to sell you like Ace Combat 5 later. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it tried, to, it, yeah, it tried to sell me Ninja Assault. Anyway, thank you, RealNet, for all of your support and to all of our patrons who have supported the show throughout the years. This episode is a production of Retrograde Amnesia recorded on June 21st, 2023. Thanks, Mark, Shepherd. for the intro music. You're welcome, Chris. You can find us on Twitter at RetroAmnesiaPod. Email the podcast at podcast at RetrogradeAmnesia.com. Support us on Patreon at Patreon.com slash RetroAM and get early access bonus episodes, miniseries like Panzer Dragoon Saga, Star Ocean, Parasite Eve, and Terranigma. Yeah. And also, of course, access to the real net. Until next time, Eric. Yes, we will kill God. And now you may go back to sleep. That's because, well, maybe if I turn my headphones down, I won't be able to hear the dog as much. And I'll just hear myself and you. Um, no, that doesn't work. Speaking of Jintoki, Jintoki weighs in on the real net tonight and mentions that the DVD did not have all of the cutscenes. Right. Uh, it was good, cold down. Oh, gotcha. I don't know if you said that or not. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'll cut that and put it in the outtakes. <laughs> <It's a> possibility. <laughs> what ruled fantasy and animation in Star Wars 2000? Oops, I just said one. Are you ready? No, Have we no. spilled any drinks in this podcast before? Not, not since we've had this table. Oh, well, this table? No, I don't think so. No. I think we've spilled one on like yeah. the, the white table, that the white... Uh, yeah, like I knocked it over and like it dripped and we both just instantly went into cleanup mode. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the only equipment that was like, just like a laptop though, so all we had to do was just pick it yeah. up. I mean like...
I, I care about you. You saved my life. Of course, you wouldn't feel anything like that about me. Of course not. You're a robot. <laughs>